You have heard it said, blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. Which of course means that familial bonds will always be stronger than the bonds of friendship or the bonds of love. And while this is in fact not a biblical proverb, it actually is an expression dating back to 12th century England, while it's not a biblical proverb, it might as well be. And I say that because if you were to comb through the pages of the Old Testament, those scriptures in which Jesus was steeped from an early age, you would walk away with the very distinct impression that family matters above all else. Most famously, the fifth of the Ten Commandments instructs us, honor thy mother and thy father which seems like a totally reasonable kind of commandment until we discover in the following chapter, Exodus chapter 21, that the penalty for failing to do so is death by stoning. Less famously, the book of Proverbs is full of little axioms about the importance of maintaining good relationships with our siblings. One proverb reminds us that a sibling is born for a time of adversity, while another proverb cautions that a sibling wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city. And then, even less famously yet, in the book of Numbers, Moses gives explicit instruction to the Israelites that should a member of their family be unlawfully killed or murdered, it was the duty of the victim's nearest male relative to act as the, and I'm not making this up, The the nearest male relative was to act as the quote-unquote avenger of blood. And what the avenger of blood did was, was seek justice by killing the individual who was responsible for the death of the relative. In the case that you weren't in a particularly vengeful mood and would happily accept a monetary payment from the killer instead, too bad, says the book of Numbers. It is your duty to put that murderer to death because you are family. So while it might not use these specific words to say, according to the Old Testament, blood is indeed thicker than water. In fact, says the Old Testament, blood is thicker than anything. Which is why. Which is why the events in this morning's story from chapter 12 of the Gospel of Matthew should come as somewhat of a shock to us as we read about them. Because certainly, certainly they would have left agape the mouths of every person who was there in the flesh. So here's the situation. Jesus is continuing his travels through the Galilean countryside, doing quintessential Jesus-type things, preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God, healing the sick, and exercising the demon possessed. At some point, and the text isn't too big on details here, uh, Jesus enters into someone's home where he continues his teaching. People are crowded both inside and outside this little house, pressing in to hear all that he has to say. And as Jesus is speaking to all those who have gathered around him, his mother and his brothers come to see him. Now here, it's interesting to note that in Mark's telling of the same story, he includes a detail that Matthew does not. When Mark tells this story, he is quite explicit that Jesus' family wasn't coming to merely pay a social call on their beloved son and brother. Rather, having heard about all that he was doing, his family believed Jesus to be off his gourd rowing with only one oar in the water, so to speak. And so they came to collect him and take him back home as to preserve their family's honor. Now, whether or not Jesus was privy to his family's intentions, we are not told. But we are told that when someone alerts Jesus to his family's presence, far from honoring his mother and taking caution not to wrong his brothers, Jesus just ignores them. He he ignores them. He doesn't even deign to go to the door and tell them to take a hike. Instead, without breaking the stride of his teaching, he puts this rhetorical question to the crowd. He says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Jesus then points to his disciples and says, look, these are my mother and brothers. 
Anyone, he says, anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. And I want you to listen to that again. He says, anyone who does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Anyone who does the will of God is family. Now, I, I don't know about you, but to me, the, the, the doing of God's will, that sounds like a fairly high bar, doesn't it? Doing the will of God. That sounds like a very high standard to, to try to me, almost intimidatingly so. But at the same time, that also sounds like a rather nebulous standard. I mean, how do you know whether or not you are actually doing God's will? First thing in the morning, you get out of bed. Is it God's will that you eat a Pop-Tart for breakfast or Eggs Benedict? Standing in front of your closet, is it God's will that you wear a plain black t-shirt and jeans or a lime green leisure suit? You get in your car to go to work. Is it God's will that you listen to NPR or the soundtrack from Hamilton? And while these are jokey examples, they highlight the fact that it is, in fact, impossible to know definitively what God's will is in any particular situation. Be it something trivial, like what you'll eat for breakfast, or something of greater consequence, like, should I get married? Should I accept this job offer? Should I move to a new city? The hard but honest truth is that that out of, outside of one or two big moments in any human life where you have a God-given moment of call and clarity, where you just know, right? You just know that it's God's will that you embark on one particular path over another. Outside of those few moments in our lives, the doing of God's will can feel like a bit of a crapshoot. That's why theologians like to distinguish between what they call God's secret will and God's revealed will. God's secret will, sometimes referred to as God's hidden will, refers to the fact that God is sovereign and rules meticulously over everything. The basic idea is that nothing in our world happens outside of God's will. And it's called hidden or secret because we don't know what God's will is until it's already come to pass. You arrive at a destination, and although you had no idea where you were headed along the way, looking back, you can see, see clearly how your journey led you to exactly where you are. Has anyone else had that experience? I know that I certainly have. By contrast, God's revealed will refers to those spiritual truths eked out over the millennia of lived experience with God. Those truths passed down to us through Scripture and attested to by generations of the faithful. So, so for instance, we believe that it's God's will for us to, to bridle our tongues, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. We believe it's God's will that we not murder or steal or cheat or lie or slander or gossip or boast. And it's called God's revealed will because we believe these things have been revealed to God's people over time and for us most fully in the life and the teachings of Jesus who taught us that above all else, it's God's will that we should love one another. And so when Jesus is talking about doing God's will in today's passage, he's not talking about God's secret will because no one can know that except in retrospect. But what each of us can do is focus on the doing of God's revealed will, loving each other in the choices that we make and in the actions that we take. And what's more, what Jesus says in this morning's passage is that we should count anyone who does God's will as our own family. Anyone. So just this past week, a, uh, a very interesting email popped into my inbox. And for the sake of confidentiality, I'm not going to share any names or other identifying information. But I received an email from a guy in our neighborhood who has been walking by our building for some time now. Uh, he, walks by, uh, he walks by just about every day as he's out for his morning constitutional. 
So he's been walking by and he started to get curious about what our whole deal was. So of course he did as you do in this day and age and he Googled us and he checked out our website. And on our website, he ended up navigating his way to our statement on inclusion. Now on a basic level, our statement on inclusion is just a way of letting folks know that there are no barriers to participating fully in the life of our community. If you've been around for a while, you, you've heard it before, but here's some of what that statement says. It says, you are welcome here, whether you are gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender, whether you are filthy rich or dirt poor, whether you speak English real, real good like, or no habla inglés. We extend a special welcome to those who are married or divorced or widowed or happily single, or to those who spend hours every day swiping right indiscriminately. We welcome screaming babies and excited toddlers, not to mention their adult caretakers, both the sleepy and the well-caffeinated. We welcome you whether you can sing like Madonna or are better left lip-syncing to all of our songs. You're welcome here if you're just browsing, just woke up, or just got out of jail. And on and on it goes at some length. If you want to check it out for yourself, you can go to hillsidemedford.org and just click the, the rainbow icon in the upper right corner of the site. Uh, and while you're there, feel free to go to our donation page. It's another favorite page on our website. In any case, in any case, upon reading this page and being touched by the love and the openness that he saw represented in it, he decided to reach out. He was interested in getting involved in our community, uh, but there was just one hitch. He had just one single concern. And it was this. He said, I am a committed, lifelong atheist. Would that be a problem? And what could I do? I mean, I mean, what choice did I have? I had to set this guy straight. I, I, I had no choice but to go, tell the guy straight up. I had to tell him that, that a professed atheist who loves their neighbor is far, far closer to the heart of our faith than someone who pre professes themselves a Christian, but then uses the Bible to justify the hatred that they have in their heart. And why did I say that? Well, I mean, what did we hear Jesus say this morning? He said that, that anyone who does the will of God is family unto us. There are no contingencies in that statement, are there? Jesus doesn't say anyone who, who does the will of God and, and, and is aware they're doing it, anyone who does the will of God and accepts the creeds of the early church, anyone who does the will of God and is the picture of Christian orthodoxy, no, he just says anyone, anyone, whether they are atheist or Muslim or Hindu or Jewish, anyone, whether they are Republican or Democrat, anyone, whether they are American, Ukrainian, or Russian, anyone who, who, who does God's will, he says, should be counted by us as nearer and dearer than our own flesh and blood. Friends, blood may be thicker than water, but according to Jesus, love is much thicker, so much thicker than blood. May all of us come to believe that truth, and more importantly, may all of us come to live that truth. In Jesus' name, amen.